have to commit tonight to God's hands, so I will call on the chief imam of National Mosque Abuja. Please, ladies and gentlemen, a grand uncle of our guest of honor's mother, actually. Please welcome Professor Shehu Galadanchi. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. We thank Almighty God, Almighty Allah, for bringing us to this very special occasion, this very special evening. We thank Him for bringing us to this evening. We thank Him also for making it possible for all of us to come to this evening. We pray that Almighty Allah will bless us in what we will be doing. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzat amma yisifun wa salamu ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, sir. Now let's feast our eyes on the screen and focus as we have a special message from the UN Deputy Secretary General. Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends, it is my pleasure to share this moment with you today to celebrate the birthday of His Highness Muhammad Sanusi II. I would like to honor you, Your Highness, and all the work that you have done and continue to do in the region. As a United Nations Secretary General's SDG advocate, you have tirelessly pushed for quality education and gender equality, especially in Africa. As a former governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, you implemented policies that would ensure gender equality in leadership positions. Your contribution to building a robust infrastructure for quality education across Nigeria has transformed the lives of millions. And still, you do not rest. The new Sustainable Development Goals Challenge in partnership with a million teachers has the mission of reaching young girls in the most deprived regions of the world. Some are calling the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on schooling a generational catastrophe. Recent school closures have undone much of what was already a difficult process, and an estimated 101 million additional children have fallen below the minimum reading proficiency level in 2020. Just before the pandemic, only 53% of young people were completing secondary school globally. In sub-Saharan Africa, it was 29%. Disparities like these are even more extreme, depending on the geographical location and household wealth. Your SDG challenge is a sophisticated and ambitious approach to this grand issue. But it is also strongly grounded in the regional and communal realities. Under your leadership, I have no doubt that this challenge will be met with success and it will surely be a significant milestone in our crucial journey to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. American lyricist Oscar Hammerstein II once wrote, a bell's not a bell till you ring it, a song's not a song till you sing it, and love isn't love till you give it away. It is easy to say that one cares about the greater good, but putting words into action is something that we should honor and commend. His Highness Muhammad Sanusi II is a man who rings the bell, a man who sings the song, and a man who gives his time, effort, and even his own birthday celebration to the betterment of the world. So congratulations, Your Highness, and I wish you a very happy birthday. Remembering, of course, I senior you. Ladies and gentlemen, to give us his opening remarks, I'd like to call on someone who I hold in very high esteem, Dr. Herbert Wigwe, to give us the chairman's opening remarks. It's my very, very deep honor and privilege to introduce to you someone who hardly needs any introduction, certainly not in Nigeria and across Africa, His Highness the 14th Emir of Kanu, the Khalifa of Tijani, Tijania Order, Khalifa Muhammadu Sanusi II. I think he does deserve a round of applause today. But there are two things we're doing here today. The first is the presentation of a book. It's a book which reflects several compilations 
of His Highness's interests in religion, in nation building, in gender issues, in Islamic theology and philosophy. But the second, which is more important, is around contributing to the support of the girl child, particularly underserved children. His latest enterprise is the Sustainable Development Goals Challenge. And what this serves to do is to basically see how you can create several more teachers. And in fact, his target is to create about 1,000 good quality teachers in the first instance, teachers who embrace innovation and are seeking very, very interesting ways of ensuring that they follow very um, community-based development activities to ensure that they achieve the development, the SDG goals. In working with the one million teachers, the idea is also to make sure that over the next five years, we can find ourselves in a situation where you have two million children, two million underserved girls educated. And I think that is very, very important. And it's not a lot of money we're looking for. The idea is that through what has been established as Mohammed Sanusi II SDG Trust, Trust Challenge, we should be able to raise at the minimum $2 million to support this initiative over the next five years. And that's the minimum figure. But I'm going to start by saying that today we have already received very, very significant support. And I want to thank all the bank managing directors who are here today for their great contributions. So tonight is about celebrating this supreme leader and to raise funds for this important initiative. So I think as we go on in today's event, I just want to say again, please sit down and enjoy yourself. There is a very interesting documentary sharing His Highness's history. Thank you very much and please enjoy yourselves. Thank you. He's a man that has seen it all. I had a confrontation with the National Assembly once. Very passionate about issues that affect society. A senator asked me, are you tired of your job? And I said to him, my name is Senusi Lamido Senusi, not CBN government. I just want to know a little bit about your antecedents, your birth, when were you born? What are those things that affected you growing up? I was born in Kano, 1961. I was born into the Kano royal family. My grandfather, the Emir Mohammed Senussi, was the 11th Fulani Emir of Kano. He named me after himself, and he abdicated the throne in 1963 when I was barely two years old. I spent my early years in Lagos. My father was then here in Lagos in the Prime Minister's office as director of research, basically doing the intelligence work uh, from the Ministry of External Affairs. On my mother's side, my mother comes from a long line of religious scholars, uh, and they're all either imams or qadis, okay, Sharia court judges, so from background of scholarship. Assalamu alaikum. When my father was going abroad, there was this big decision he had to make, which was whether to take me with him or leave me in Nigeria and members of his family were generally concerned about a prince being taken out to Europe where he might grow up and not learn about his religion and be totally disconnected from his culture. So he took the difficult decision to leave his children in Nigeria. And I went to one of his uncles, Al-Haji Muhammad Inouwada, who, who was then Minister of Defense. So I was there until 1966 when the coup happened and the Wada family moved to Kano, I moved to Kano. And shortly after that, I was enrolled at St. Anne's Primary School, which is a Catholic uh, primary school in Kaduna, at the age of eight, a boarding school, from where I went on to King's College and then ABU. So I've been shaped by so many influences. A lot of these subtle influences have influenced my life, they've influenced my thoughts. So many of the core ideas that I think have defined me in my professional life 
were acquired from those early um, early years um, in my life. So tell me a little bit about your family. It's a very traditional family. Um, I have four wives. The first two were related to me. One on my father's side, one on my mother's side. The third uh, is a friend, uh, uh, is a lawyer. The, the fourth, a princess from a family that's close to my family. My children, I've been blessed with 13 children, eight of whom are girls, one of, the, one of them is a baby. Like my father, my principal focus with all of them has been to say, go get educated. My first son, he had read accounting at Buckingham. He said he wanted to join the police. I was surprised. So he's an ASB in the police. Uh, but he's going in September to Leicester to do a master's in police studies. For the girls, uh, the, the older ones have all gone through their master's degrees. Uh, some are married. Uh, I have, I'm, I'm a grandfather now. Uh, oh, well, I, 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 two of my daughters are married with my son and they've got, all got children. Uh, alhamdulillah. This year, uh, in the, I'll be in the UK doing a PhD. I'm doing the PhD is also to let them know that they've got no excuse. Mm. Uh, you know, if I at 60, I'm going to start a PhD, all of you had better start applying. That's amazing, in, starting uh, a PhD at 60. Yeah. My father was always rather different uh, uh, from me. I mean, he was a prince. He was the crown prince of Kano. He was Chiroma. Even though he had the title of Chiroma of Kano, he never really had uh, an interest or an ambition to be the Emir. Now he knew that I had an interest in it and he never he never stopped me, uh, but he always said to me, don't put it in your head, focus on your education, focus on a career, be something. What I would like is that you do not end up as the son of Ambassador Senussi. I would like you to be something in your own right. So I remember when I became CEO of First Bank, when I became governor of Central Bank, I said, Alhamdulillah, this is what my father wanted for me. That the idea was break away from this sense that I am the son of this person. Yeah. I was born into this family. And, and I've seen too many of my relatives, too many of my cousins and princes who are nothing mm. other than that they were born to this Amir or born to this. And if you take that away from them, they're nothing. You, you know, in 2012, as Governor of the Central Bank, I got the Bankers Committee to declare that year the year of the woman in banking. And we issued a number of guidelines. Among them were that the banks would strive in every recruitment exercise to ensure that at least 50% of those that they recruited were women. That banks would actively seek to promote at least 40% of management positions to be held by women. And that banks would try to have at least 30% of board positions held by women. The central bank was established in 1959. I became governor in 2009. In 50 years, only four women had made director in the central bank. I appointed eight female directors in one year. We basically took areas where men had dominated and monopolized and put women there. And those women proved that they could do this job as well and even better than the men. And we empowered them. Let me quickly segue it into this. Girl child education, you've always been passionate about now your SDG goals and one million teachers. I mean, you had a great session with the president of Ghana, Nana Kufadu. How does that make you feel? I mean, look, the, the Ghanaian president is wonderful and the, no, and, and the prime minister of Norway and, and they're the co-chairs of, of the SDG advocates and they have shown extremely profound leadership. And, and a number of colleagues, um, as, that, as you that saw on that platform, you know, young people uh, who have been chosen by the UN Secretary General to be advocates um, uh, for SDGs. Um, and I've been focused on SDG 4, which is education, largely girl child education, SDG 5, which is gender equality, um, and SDG 8, which is um, about decent work. And this challenge was about teachers. Teachers who are actually involved in dealing with poor people in their communities. Show us what you are doing that um, provides education, that can give, get education to underserved populations. Simple ideas from the teachers themselves who, who engage, who work with, with children. So basically, there's a complex populations, underserved populations, you know, um, we, try to, we try to reach them. I'll segue this conversation into your book. So obviously your book is a collection of writings over the years. What was the mind behind writing that book? First of all, I never set out to write a book. Okay, um, these were a collection of articles um, and, and started as debates. After I came back from my studies in the Sudan, uh, this was at the height of the problems with General Abacham. 
uh, the fact that Nigerians were tired of military rule, the fact that he had set up these political parties and he was determined to self-perpetuate. And if you picked any newspaper in Nigeria, the so-called Hausa Fulan were the evil people. They were the ones who were responsible for the destruction of Nigeria and so on. And it disturbed many of us, especially Northern progressives. And, and we had a meeting um, once in my house in Kano and we had uh, Kabir Yusuf, who was the first editor and owner of the Weekly Trust and the Daily Trust. So Kabir Yusuf said, you know, I want to start a newspaper, but for the newspaper to really be effective, you guys have to write. Writing that expressed an opposition to dictatorship, um, support for democracy and progressive ideas from Northerners. So this was how being a regular columnist started. Um, uh, basically a passion to express a view and to um, serve as a corrective to what I saw as a very unfair narrative. Uh, all of this good work you've done, all of this advocacy ties around the economy. It's just been a slippery slope. Okay, so let me give an idea of um, how, how bad things are. If you look at the World Bank development indicators, in 1980, on a PPP basis, our per capita GDP was 2,180 in 1980, 2,229 in, 19, in 2019. Now at this rate, by 2023, on a per capita basis PPP, we will be back where we were in 1980. Mm. We have been set back 40 years. When we talk about huge devaluations or high rates of inflation and low rates of um, a GDP growth and um, excessive rates of population growth, all of these factors come in into that number because your, the rate of growth, if your population is growing faster than your GDP, your per capita income goes down anyway, even if nothing happened to inflation rates and, and, and exchange rates. Now, when you compound that with high rates of inflation and high rates of devaluation, then on a dollar basis, the rate of collapse is huge. And that's what we've had in the last five years. We've had growth that has been outstripped by population growth. You've had inflation that's in the upper double digits, and you've had massive devaluation of the currency. And that has wiped out all the work that was done in the 35 years prior to 2015. To my mind, we had decisions that should have been taken in 2015, 2016, they should have been taken actually much earlier. Remember in 2011, we had this big debate over the removal of fuel subsidy. That has been a major problem. I have been screaming about this for over a decade. It's unsustainable. Uh, even if um, this was all subsidy, you were, you were subsidizing consumption. Totally, I, I, do, I have never understood why we believe that for the poor people of this country, giving them cheap petrol is more important than giving them education or giving them healthcare, because that's what it is. I mean, you, these things are about choice. You're taking money, you know, out of education, taking money out of healthcare, taking money out of infrastructure, and putting it in subsidizing the importation of petroleum products that will make profits and create jobs in England and France, who were the major countries exporting petroleum products to us and all producing country by the way which cannot fix its own refineries i believe that we had a great opportunity when we had a change in government to put this economy on reset and, and i think most of my problems with, with, with politicians came from my saying out that we were not taking those steps and we were placing the country on the path to bankruptcy. So what happened? We spent, the, uh, before COVID, before 2020, we spent five years, four, five years, paying out trillions as petroleum subsidy at a time when oil price was low and government revenue was low. Now, when you pay all those trillions, what happens? You've still got to pay salaries. You've still got to do your infrastructure. You've still got to spend money. Um, and then you push in your debt limit. So you keep borrowing and you get to a point where 87% of your revenue, according to the World Bank, is being used to service debt and it's still not enough. And then you put pressure on the central bank to print the money for you to monetize the deficit because the central bank cannot allow the government to collapse. But the, the, the reason the central bank has to fill the hole is because the government did not take the necessary but difficult political decision not to create that hole in the first place. But when the central bank monetizes the deficit, then you exert pressure on the exchange rate and on the rate of inflation. And then the decisions become even more impossible. 
because whereas you could have removed subsidy in 2015 and maybe be paying what 190 naira per litre if you remove the subsidy today at current exchange rates you may need to buy petrol at 380 or 400 naira per litre so it looks even more impossible than in 2015 but it has been made more impossible because when we should have taken the decision we did not and, and, and I think for me, this is why I'm not too sympathetic uh, uh, to the administration. I think, the, I think the, the, the problems that we have were foreseen, they were foreseeable. Every economist would have told you that this is where we're going to end up on exchange rates. This is where we're going to end up with inflation. This is where we're going to end up with the fiscal position of government. You cannot continue um, digging a hole. If you find yourself in a hole, you stop digging. But we found ourselves in a hole in 2015 and continue digging ourselves into a deeper hole. I think, for me, this was the source of my problems, saying it. Unfortunately, um, I've always said, I am not a problem. You, you can take me out, you can, you can kill me, you can jail me, you can, you can say anything about me. It will not change the numbers. It will not change the poverty levels. It will not change inflation, it will not change exchange rates. At the end of the day, you've got to implement the right policy. I don't care what you do to me, but just do the right thing. So we are in a difficult position. And, 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 and to be honest, we are today in an economic mess that is uh, far, far worse than we were uh, in 2015. So I, I think that um, we need debt relief. I think we need to do the belt tightening. And I think we need to send out clear signals that we've got to have a strong fiscal position. I really feel sorry for the governor of Central Bank. I feel sorry for the Minister of Finance. I, I, I don't know how I would cope if I was there uh, 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 at this point in time. Very, very exciting insight you shared there. But looking back at your life 60 years, you know, down the line, let's just take a panoramic view. You've, you've seen it all. What would you say about your life in the next 60 years? My plan, I want to strengthen, for example, my fluency in French. I want to do my PhD in Islamic law. With the PhD and with the publications I'm making, I'm now working on a book on my central bank years. I thank God that at 60, uh, my children and everybody can turn around and say, well, you know, this is someone who was a chief risk officer, who was a CEO, who was governor of Central Bank, who was Amir, who was Khalifa Tijan. And that's, um, I imagine that's more than many people achieve in, in many lifetimes. Thank you so much. I mean, 60 years is about you running your race. And in the end, it's about running your race and you know, doing it your own way. Thank you so much, Your Highness. Thank you so much for this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a father, brother, husband, grandfather, theologian, royal father, emir of Kano, fine boy emeritus. Ladies and gentlemen, one more time for the special guest of honor, His Highness Mohammed Sanusi II. Come on. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we've given you documentary, we've given you this and that, but now let's entertain you with some music. Let's welcome on stage Esther Benyogo. Good evening, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests. It's an honor to be here today. And as a girl child, I'm here to urge you all to support His Excellency tonight. Thank you very much. The children are our future. Teach them well and let them lead the way. Show them all the beauty they possess inside. Give them a sense of pride to make it easier. Let the children's laughter remind us how we used to be. Allow me to uh, introduce to the microphone very, very quickly, someone who is a columnist himself, uh, a writer, an author as well, and CEO of Alpha Communications. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Tunde Fabenli. Back about 10 years ago, I came across when I was still having my column and in the social media, came across uh, these writings of this, this man. Sanusi, let me do Sanusi. And the more I read about it, the more I came across his writings, the, the more 
bowed over, I, I became an usher. Then on one of the social media email group, you know, not very private one, he came, he was, he was one of the members on the group, and I was. So, that, you know, taking us on on topical issues. So I sent him a private email challenging some of his views. Lo and behold, came a reply. Governor of Central Bank is replying me email. I couldn't believe it. And that's how we, we got together. Um, so much has been said and written about SLS. But here we are. The book is in the light of day. And I commend it to you. Here then is the mind of a great thinker, a theologian, uh, an intellectual public speaker, Sanusi Lamido Sanusi SLS, the Khalifa Mohammed Sanusi II. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody. I know you want to hustle low. You want to make money to travel around the globe. I know you want all the titles, though. Make the sky your home, become a rolling stone. So please, mo, mo, mo. Mama, and it's on show. Mo, mo, mo. Mama, and it's on show. And when you feel like you've got it all, and you don't heed the calls, Mama, and it's on show. Just remember that this pride must come before that fall. Mama and it won't you. Thank you. <laughs> your Excellencies, your Royal Highnesses, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. The book that is being presented today, For the Good of the Nation, Essays and Perspectives, which includes essays, conference papers, and three interviews published over the last two decades, is not only a kind of manifesto by the author about Nigeria's problems and possibilities, it is also a testament to the author's prodigy, as well as a demonstration of his eclectic, even if polemical take on the most critical issues of our time. Most significant is the fact that the book is a testimony to the author's faith in Nigeria's possibilities and our collective future as a people. Whether he's reflecting on the debates on the restructuring of the Federation, redistributive justice, and radical democratic imagination interrogating Muslim political thought in the modern world, the intellectual sources of Islamist identities, or engaging with Foucauldian philosophy in probing Muslim history and the discursive trends in Islamic law in the context of Nigeria's ethno-regional and ethno-religious tensions, including the struggle among Nigeria's ruling and ruining class. The author's specific liberal spirit and commitment to Nigeria is strongly reflected in this book. For instance, this spirit and commitment lead the author to embrace the liberating and liberationist ethos of Thomas Paine and Bertrand Russell, even while rejecting their atheism. As my late friend, Pius Adesomi, so ably captures it in his foreword to this book, the author demonstrates the core obligations of public intellection, not just in speaking truth to power, but also in stubbornly confronting headlong some of the complex and difficult issues of the Nigerian Union, including those regarding the precept, nature, and future of the Union, the character of ethno-regional relations, as well as elite politics, religion, and the politics of piety, and also the uncomfortable questions of gender equality in Northern Nigeria. I believe that beyond the polemics of the essays in this book, beyond the matters we agree or might disagree on, 
Beyond the author's pedigree, his philosophical engagements with politics, religion, and society, and his intellectual fascination with contrarian praxis. Beyond all this is the faith, as the book affirms, that binds us together in this potentially geared but much abused polity. Against this backdrop, distinguished guests, I leave you with the core message of the book, which is captured in Sonu Okosun's charge. Let's save Nigeria, so Nigeria will not die. I thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, I crave your indulgence and let's welcome our guest of honor, the man who's assembled us all here tonight. Just to say a few words, Your Highness, just a few words. I know you're quite passionate about everything that's happening, but we have so much more in store for you tonight. So please, if your hands are not too busy, let's welcome His Highness, Khalifa Mohammed Sanusi II, 14th Emir of Kanu. I think we can do much better than that. Let's keep it going all the way until he gets up here to say a few words. 60 never looks so good. Rank I did it, sir. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Your Excellencies, and I'm overwhelmed, obviously, by the turnout today. Uh, we had the Governor of Lagos, Kaduna, Ekiti, Ondo, Edo, A representation from the Governors of Sokoto and Yobe. And we have His Excellency, Pastor Tunde Bakari, his Royal Majesty, the Oni of Ife, my brother, my friend, and the Emirs of Duku and Awe, the, His Eminence, the Sultan, sent the Sir King Yagyam Binji. He got his invitation too late, and there's a representative from the Emir of Ringim. The guest of honor and keynote speaker, my friend, my brother, my successor, Godwin Emefiele, Governor of the Central Bank. <laughs> the Chairman Herbert and all the friends who are gathered here. And I will recognize my great uncle, the Grand Imam of the National Mosque, uh, Professor Shehu Galadenchi. And of course, my long-suffering wives, thank you for bearing with me all these years. A little over a year ago, I was appointed one of the UN SDG advocates. And it's a role I take seriously because anybody who tells me to advocate development is telling me to advocate what I believe in. And so while I don't have a state, while I don't have a budget, Advocacy cannot just be about talking. And therefore, in my position as chair of the advisory council of one million teachers, I decided to have a challenge. And this is why we're here today. I keep saying it is not a book launch. It's not a book launch because not one penny that is raised today will come to me not even to refinance the cost of publishing this book. I paid for the publication, but I'm not asking for the money back. Everything, everything you give today is going to a fund. And that fund is to promote and scale up the SDG challenge. We said we want teachers to come up with innovative ideas. And we try to make sure that it's not, we're not looking for high tech. 
you know, primary school teachers working in rural communities, working with people, just tell us what ideas you have for improving the quality of education to the poor and underserved areas of Africa. And let's see which ideas are cheap and scalable. You know, we had 900 entries from across Africa. And over months, working with Queen's University, we kept scaling them down, cutting them down until we arrived at 10 winners. In one of the conversations with one million teachers, they said, you know, we're going to need money to do this, and it's going to be difficult. And I said, how much do you need? And they went and did some numbers to reach, to make an impact. You will need at least $2 million. Or whatever it is. And I said, okay, we'll raise it. And they were shocked. I was not worried about raising the money. What I really wanted was to see you, to sit with you, to celebrate this day with you, to let you know what the money is going to be used for, and to hope and pray that this fund will grow and be a major catalyst for the kind of change that we want for delivering education. I thank you very much for listening, and I wish you a very happy evening. Come on, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let's hear it for the man of the moment, the birthday boy himself, His Highness Khalifa Mohammed Sanusi II. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Please permit me to stand on existing protocol. Now, I've seen firsthand the challenges that teachers face in embracing, fully embracing that role of the change maker, the lack of networks, the confusing bureaucracy, the different language and lexicon that has to be learned along the way. But I've also seen how natural a transition that really is. Teachers have so many of the prerequisites. They know how to listen. They know how to bring out the best in their students. But teachers can't do it alone. It's the responsibility of all of us to ensure that our teachers have the tools that they need to deliver on their incredibly important role and on the enormous potential that they have. This year, in coordinating His Highness's Challenge, I've had the distinct pleasure of working with teachers. Their energy and their commitment was instrumental in the success of this pilot initiative. I'd like to thank His Highness Mohammed Sanusi II for his incredible leadership and for laying out a vision for the future of education in Africa. Thank you. It is now time to present the certificates to uh, the cohort. This is Jane Chikapa. Jane is from Namibia. Malawi, from Malawi, <laughs> from Malawi. And her project is the, the, the Bloomers Learning Initiative, which is basically an essay competition for young writers, which has been a great success in Malawi. And we hope we can take care of her. The next. Mahfouz. This is the prison. Okay, prison. Mahfouz runs a school in the prisons, basically training prisoners up to all levels. And, and it's something we hope we can franchise and roll out to prisons across Africa and have cohorts of prisoners. Anita, you're up next. Anita, Dyslexia Center. This is the lady. At the, the, now, the governor of Kaduna, when he saw the program, said he wanted to call Anita in to help her. I said, no, please wait until I have unveiled her publicly and she's taken her award. And now I hand you over to my friend and my brother who is very much interested in your project in Kaduna. Wow, wow. Wow. And, and which we hope will roll out to all dyslexics across the continent. Thank you. Wow. Your Excellencies, I'm also Thank a teacher. Majesty. Thank you, Majesty. Thank you, Majesty. Yes, sir. Thank Olufemi, you. Olufemi, <laughs> Folakwamili. 
Thank you, Your Majesty. Femi. Olufemi. Fola Kwamile has his certificate, sir. Okay. Yes, this is um, his learning to learn. That's for your excellency, please. Yeah. His project, Learning to Learn, uh, basically ad looks at the problem. People don't know how to learn. So you actually have to teach them how to learn. Interesting ideas, interesting uh, uh, innovations. Next. Adejo Idoko. Adejo Idoko. Adejo, which is yours? What? Girls, what? Okay, yeah, this is a tech competition. This is technology. This is only real tech. Also from Kaduna. <laughs> Rashida Sadiq. Rashida, that's the reader room, right? Rashida is the lady with the reader room I spoke about. <laughs> Thank you, Excellency. Olu Shagwin Lori. Shagwin Lori. Finally. Finally, Lagos. Which one is yours? Malfoots is from Lagos as well, I think. Malfoots is Lagos as well, right? Yes. Which, which is yours? Oh, that's unusual school. What's it, man? Going to rural areas, engage them street learning. Yeah, that's it. We found this project interesting because it goes around the need to start building brick and mortar. You actually go and take education to them wherever they are. And yeah, it's not a usual school buildings, but it's a school and they learn. And it's sad we haven't seen the videos. Interesting uh, projects. Okay. Yeah. MSC Jatolua. MSC. Which is MSC? Which is, which is yours? Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's the workbook initiative. Uh, the workbook initiative, uh, which basically gets um, education to children where the internet cannot get to. And I think it was inspired by poor children who did not have access to online learning because they don't have network. And how do you get it to them? Okay. Ajibola. Ajibola. No, um, I'm sorry, Ajibola is unwell. Um, she's not here. Ajibola had, uh, ha, has a project for integrating sustainability education into education. And, and this is very uh, right down the street with the global goals. So from primary school, secondary school, children are taught the importance of the environment and sustainability in what they do. And that is critical to their way of thinking. Um, we're sad she's unwell and unable to be with us today. Rizma will collect on... on oh, Rizma will collect on behalf of... On behalf. Uh, And finally, Habiba Abdurabi. Habiba Abdurabi. Finally, somebody from Kano. <laughs> and, and we liked her idea because one of the major issues with education is we talk about functionality. So congratulations, team. Each of them has been given $500 as a prize. And each of them will have $10,000 seed money to scale up their ideas and the structure of the trustees. <laughs> but then they have given us a franchise, so it means that we will train teachers and they will help us train teachers who make sure that these ideas are rolled over. And hopefully by next year and thereafter, inshallah, we'll be able to tell you how many teachers we have trained, how many students we have reached, what are the outcomes that we have um, as a result of that. Thank you, Your Majesty. Thank you, Your Excellencies. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank, you. thank you, Your Highness. And congratulations to all of you. Thank you. So now I'm going to call on Mr. Godwin Emefile, C-O-N, the Governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria, to drive this fundraising moments that we have. So I'll hand over the microphone to him. I feel honored to have been given the privilege to be, to be doing this today. And I promise you that we will do our best to ensure that we raise more than $2 million for this project. At the Bankers Committee, we did, make a, we did deliberate on this subject. 
and we have agreed on what it would be better. Like, I would crave your indulgence. Usually, you'll find that bankers will not come out and begin to say what they will contribute. When the time comes and the accounts are published, you will all know how much each of the banks has contributed towards resolving the challenge of the girl child. And I can assure you on my honor that the funds will be used judiciously. We know those of you, like the Khalifa said himself, aside from the bankers, aside from the CBN governor, we saw some governors here. We will be writing you, we will be calling on you, we will call on your commissioner of finance. Well, for those of you who don't have commissioners yet, I see Obaseki has left. We will call on him to bring his contribution. I see the richest man in Africa. It's not easy to be the richest black man on Mother Earth, on the world, in the world. Abdul Samad Rabiu, we're all together on Kakovi. The Kakovi team will do something to ensure that we honor you, Khalifa. Ike Imokwede, let me specially recognize you for being here from the beginning to the end. I recognize you and really thank you for being here for your patience. And again, we will call on you. Both those who, have been, who are currently CEOs or bankers or those who have retired, we will call on you. Elijah Mangal, I saw you. I don't know if he has left. If he has left or you haven't left, we will call on you. But if you can crave, crave your indulgence, please submit your pledge form and pledge cards so that we know how much you are contributing. This is a noble challenge. This is a noble cause that we should support. I repeat, the government cannot do it alone. We do need the support of private sector and well-meaning people like you, both Nigerians and those of you outside Nigeria, to please support this worthy and noble gesture. Oni, thank you very much for being here. Your little, whatever you can contribute. Ah. Even before he became money, we know he had money. And he still has money. So that's why I had to really recognize and mention your presence. We will be calling on you. Our royal fathers, thank you so much for being here. We will please need your support to, for this noble project. I thank you all. Good evening. I'll call on His Highness, supported ably by Mr. Governor Babajide Sonolu, uh, on your fair. Dr. Herbert Wigwe, Aigimokwede, Alaji Aliko, uh, to just briefly walk over to the cake. We'll cut, yes, it's right here. And of course, Malam Nasir, yes, Malam Nasir. Um, and Professor Galadanchi. And Princess, please, please uh, join us just right here, or right on the floor. You don't need to climb up on stage. And we'll have a quick cake cutting moment. Can we all sing a happy birthday very quickly? Yeah? Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Halifa, happy birthday to you. Hip, hip, hip. And now your highness, there's a special, there's a special surprise for you. Um, is going to be brought up on stage now, just before we call on Dr. Herbert. I want to call on Dick Ball at this one, yeah. Your Highness, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm standing on the existing protocols. My name is Taiwo Dutola. I'm the Managing Director and CEO of the Nigeria-Canada Trade and Investment uh, Group. In recognition of uh, His Highness's uh, vision, especially in the SDG 4, 5, and 8, NCTIG, and the 1 million teachers would like to present these two artworks for you, made by a young Nigerian artist. Good evening, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. When I was contacted to come up with a portrait art for His Highness, I asked what his legacy was, and they pointed me towards the HHMS MS2 SDG challenge. This logo right here represents the um, economic growth. This represents quality education, while this represents gender equality, which are the three 
principal SDG goals that govern this initiative. I want to call on His Majesty, His Majesty the Oni of Ife to uh, kick off our goodwill messages uh, right about now. And right after him, we'll go with uh, Malam Nasir El Rufai, um, the governor of Kaduna State, uh, to give us a few words, just a few remarks and goodwill messages. Kabi is you. It's a great honor for me to give a goodwill message on behalf of His Highness Sanusi Lamido Sanusi. We all know what he stands for. In life, you must stand for something. He believes in relationships so much. We have five governors that are here by virtue of having great relationships with them. When I came in, I told him, how do you feel today? I am very happy for you. Because how many people will still be out of power and will still be able to pull people together like this? You've been a brother and you're someone that is so dear to me and that's the truth. What I want to advise is keep doing what you're doing for you to have earned this. What you're doing today is beyond raising money for girl child. It's way beyond it. It's called relationship and people's management. You are a relationship person. Keep it up. I even want you to do more. On this note, on behalf of all the traditional rulers of this country, you are one of us. Don't think you are still not one of us. You are one of us forever. We love you. We adore you. We cherish what you stand for. And God Almighty will continue to keep you and keep your family. God bless you and bless all the works of your hand. Thank you very much. God bless you. I want to congratulate your brother who has taken it upon himself to gather all of us here today for this good cause. I congratulate our father again for this wonderful day. I pray for you that your days will be long in good health and in felicity. Thank you so much. God bless you all, and God bless Nigeria. Thank you so much. Very quickly, quick succession. I call on Malam Nasser El Rufai for a brief remarks. Your Highness, first, congratulations and happy birthday on getting to the diamond age of 60. Secondly, Your Highness, you've said many kind and complimentary things about your friends. I think it's important that on behalf of your friends, I respond. Your Highness, your friendship is permanent and pensionable. That's why our friendship, our loyalty and commitment to you are also permanent and pensionable. I speak on behalf of all the friends that you complimented by relating my own experience. And I'm sure each and every one of the names you've mentioned will have their own versions of this story. For me personally, I'm happy that God created you. Because you make me sound less controversial I know you say the same about me, but the number of troubles you've entered and got out from Abacha to the present day, I'm not sure if I had got in, I would have got out. So I wish you well, and I want to thank your family particularly, your wives, for being there for you and for all of us. May God bless you and continue to elevate you. God bless. Again, let me join all of us in this room and who participated virtually to wish you a happy 60th birthday. I have had the opportunity and the privilege to do this prior to this evening. I will speak very briefly from the perspective of admiration. The same type of admiration that I have met 
in Nigeria and across the world whenever the name Sanusi Lamido Sanusi is mentioned and discussed many times by people who have never even met you or who don't know you but have simply read about you. I remember on the day that President Obama was inaugurated as the first black president of the United States, the camera kept panning to this man with tears streaming down his eyes, not Jesse Jackson, this man, because without men like Congressman Lewis, you would never have had a black man as president of the United States. And as I admire that man, so also I admire you. Now, there was something that John Lewis said. John Lewis said, when asked, why do you cause trouble the way you do? And he said, because how will I tell my children or their children that in the face of all that was wrong, I said nothing and I did nothing? He said, yes, I caused trouble, but I caused good trouble. Call me Congressman Good Trouble. So, Your Highness, as a son, you cause good trouble. As a husband, you cause good trouble. As a father, you cause good trouble. As a risk manager, you cause good trouble. As CEO of First Bank, you cause good trouble. As governor of the Central Bank, you caused... As Emir of Kanu, you caused... As the Khalifa, you are still causing... As you will continue to cause good trouble. Congratulations, my brother. Happy birthday again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Khalifa Muhammad Sanusi II, your royal highnesses, and of course, our big brother, Governor of Kaduna State, Nasir El Rufai. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all so, so very much, particularly those who have stayed to the end. We know that um, in these days of COVID, most people tend to leave events um, a lot earlier than normal. But I guess it's again a show of respect for Khalifa that we've all stayed back, all stayed back here. But more importantly, I think a couple of things have been said very straight. The girl child education and faith are two extremely important things in nation building. And we can't say it enough. And today's event has proven extremely, extremely successful. But if Mohammed Sanusi II SDG Challenge is seeking to train two million girls just by raising two million dollars over five years, what does it tell us? It's almost a ratio of one dollar for one girl. See how cheap it is to get out of this problem. So why don't we stretch it even more and more and more and more? The central bank governor did something extremely profound by calling on several people um, to basically support this project, some of whom, by the way, have also contributed, and I think we may be getting to the additional $1 million mark, which takes us to close to $3 million. So my expectation is that as we reach out in the next couple of days to more people, we should get to the $5 million mark. Then we have a good starting point to solve this problem. All that is left is for me to say a very, very big thank you once again to each and every one of you who made it to tonight's event and to let the Khalifa know that we love you in spite of your trouble. Thank you.